Welcome back, America. It's Hugh Hewitt. Two months ago, Silicon Valley Bank surfaced its problem. And two months later, the Wall Street Journal is running a headline over the weekend. Banks are in the grips of an investor crisis of confidence. And it begins First Republic Bank seizure and sale to J.P. Morgan Chase was supposed to be a cathartic moment for American banks. The new amount of financial systems latest crisis of confidence. The relief lasted for barely a day. That's when I put out a, uh, a call to David Bonson, who is the uh, managing partner of the Bonson Group. Offices everywhere. They manage more than $4 billion of other people's money. So people trust him, and I trust David. Good morning, David. How are you? Doing well, Hugh. Good to be with you. Thank you for getting up early. Did I get you on the West Coast or the East Coast today? You got me on the West Coast today, but markets never sleep. Markets never sleep. So where do you do this from? Have you got a little camera in the house? Yeah, we have a whole studio at my office, but at 3.30, I can't get the studio manager in, so uh, we're doing it from the house. Yeah, it doesn't work that way. We should have sent you over to our production studio, and Dwayne could have growled at you. David, just go to 30,000 feet. Are you confident of the stability of the American banking system? Well, the answer is yes, Hugh, but we have to sort of take a step back to look at what is happening because it's actually unprecedented. And I don't think we're capturing the historical moment of banks failing with no credit impairment. You've had tons of financial panics, financial issues over the years. We all know the 2008 one, but at every moment, the savings and loan crisis in the late 80s, early 90s, there were people not paying money back that caused banks to have problems. And then you add the leverage and all the other things, it spirals and it can happen in a levered financial system. That's what a financial panic is. There's nothing like that going on right now. It's entirely driven around the interest rate issues and deposit levels, liquidity, it's not solvency. And so it's very unique and yet it's real. It's a real problem. Um, I am confident that the primary elements of the banking system are solvent. Even First Republic went under with more assets than liabilities. So, well, how does a bank go under if it has more assets than liabilities? Because they have to start borrowing from the Fed against their good assets for liquidity, and they're paying the Fed more than they're receiving in interest from the money they had lent out. They gave all these rich people like me loans at 2%, and they're having to pay the Fed 5%. You can't do that for very long. And America does not tolerate zombie banks the way they did in Japan, for example, for 20 years. Now, David Bonson, I, I did this in reverse order. Would you tell people who you are and what you do? I've had you on talk about your books before. People know you if they've listened to the show for a long time. But let's establish your credibility. Then we're going to talk about what we should do. Well, establishing my credibility is still something I'm working on doing with my own wife and children, but at least for listeners, I'll say I manage uh, close to four and a half billion dollars, run a private wealth firm called the Bonson Group, six offices around the country. I was a managing director at Morgan Stanley for 10 years, and I write about economics and finance at National Review and other places, and I just sort of wake up and do this all day, every day. And so you've been following money market for as long as I've known. My goodness, I've probably known you for a quarter century. I don't know when I first came and did a David Bonson Group event. You would have someone come in and talk politics to your investors. I'm not going to come talk investments to your investors because I don't know that world. But that was kind of fun. And you're still I see you opened up an office in Austin. I opened up a, I an did. affiliate in Austin. Austin. Good morning, Austin. Austin. Austin, Texas. Yes, sir. Well, why do you open an office in a particular place, by the way? Why go to, I know why you're in Newport Beach, because that's where you were, but why open five other offices? We just ended up with a client base in a certain area that uh, warranted having an office locally. We are real work from office people. We were through most of COVID as well. All 56 of our employees are required to actually go to work five days a week. So we're really unique that way. Uh, but we think uh, our clients like being in physical presence with their advisor. And so we prefer to have offices where a lot of clients are. And, um, you know, for the kind of ongoing new business that we do benefits from having offices. And we can put analysts and planners and research people on the ground. We can hire from all over the country instead of just in California and New York, where we've been for a long time. So, David Bonson, I'm going to come back and tell you about this story. 
which is the uh, the attempt by the California Air Resources Board to close the Balboa F- Island Ferry. That's a very hyper local issue that you and I should get involved in. But let's go back to the banks. What are you telling your clients about bank stocks? Because I don't know, I've, I don't have any visibility into this. I didn't even know that SVB existed or Signature Bank existed until they failed and upset the markets. So who has visibility into banking other than the Fed and the FDIC? Well, I think that the really tricky part here is that even with visibility, it may not matter because the nature of fractional reserve banking. And so what I mean by that is nobody thinks the banks have their money in the back room. Okay, you deposit your money with your bank. And if you ever want to get it electronically or otherwise, you just assume they're going to have it for you. But we all know that they're lending out more to other people than the money that they brought in. That's the banking system we've had for a hundred years that we all just sort of accept. And we count on regulators and we count on the banks to have their own equity in the bank so that your deposits will be protected. And we really don't have very many bank failures in our country. What's interesting is we've had three this year and we had 120 in the financial crisis and we're talking about them as if they're kind of similar events. Well, the reason is that these three banks that went down are pretty big. Um, You know, the signature thing was kind of unique because it was mostly crypto related. They had just taken in a lot of deposits from crypto bros and other, you know, more vulnerable depositors. And that went down real quickly and without a lot of discussion. Silicon Valley was a big bank and had grown huge during the pandemic. They added over $100 billion of new assets, new deposits very quickly. And then now at First Republic, they were a very well-run bank, but they were primarily New York and California, and they invested a lot in commercial real estate. But when I say they had more assets and liabilities, that still sounds to most people like it's fine. It's just that once people start withdrawing money, Silicon Valley, they took out $42 billion in one day, then it's not fine. That's not a good day for the CEO, is it? That's not a good day for the CF. It's not a good day for anyone when $42 billion walks out the door. It's not a good day for the people who work at the bank, and it's not a good day for the people who bank at the bank. And that's really why they did that deal they did over the weekend. Now, David, I have a question for you. Roku, I use it. I don't mean to beat up on Roku. It's just the one that stood out at me. Because I have Roku, and I use Roku, and they're fine technology. But evidently, they don't have a chief financial officer or a risk officer because they had a half billion dollars in cash deposits at the Silicon Valley Bank. With the FDIC insuring $250,000 of that, that leaves them $499,750, whatever it is. It leaves them way short of what they needed. Why would anyone do that? Well, it's sort of a mystery even beyond the FDIC protection. I mean, if you don't think the bank is going to have issues, you may not be worried about stability. But right now, when interest rates are paying 4 and 5%, why wouldn't you have money in treasury bills or, or CDs or other vehicles? You know, 4% of $500 million is pretty good money last time I checked. That's the amount of money they were not making by having some cash management account, let's say at the Bonson Group or, or anywhere else, right? So it's not just the FDIC insanity, it's the lack of opportunity that they were bypassing. Focus on that. You run cash management accounts for, I assume, a bunch of different people. How do they operate? Because I'm just mystified by people who leave money sitting around at 2%. It's just a mi- or, or no percent. It's just a Zero. mystery to me. Yeah, yeah, no, don't let's get that right because they were leaving it at zero percent. And and why would you do that? Why did people go to first wow. public? The reason is if you can borrow money for real cheap, you don't care as much what you're going to get in deposits. And so this was the trade off, and it's the trade off of all banking. You either, as a bank, want to make money by getting deposits in that you're going to lend out at more interest than you pay for those deposits. Or if you're going to be paying more for deposits, you want to lend at a higher amount to make up for it. Okay, you can't be both the highest payer in deposits and the lowest cost lender. Otherwise, you don't make any money as a bank. So there's levers that the banks have, knobs to turn to make money. First Republic, they were very open about it. We're not going to pay you in deposits, but we're going to lend you money that other banks may not lend at 2 or 3%. 
And whenever you hear this, oh, other banks may not lend, it starts to sound like 2008, subprime. No, no, no. These were very wealthy borrowers, good borrowers. Uh, I, First Republic Bank, um, I, my wife and I have a house out in East Hampton, an hour and a half away from our New York City apartment and office. 71% of the Hamptons is banked by First Republic. They, they made a marketing effort to bank at Southampton, East Hampton, affluent people that had good properties, but they wanted to go give low cost loans to earn those deposits. That's why the banks would do it. And that's basically why depositors put up with it. Now, Roku wasn't borrowing off of 500 million. So were they getting other services, other investment banking, other uh, opportunities? First opportunity to, to invest. Is, is that what they were getting? First opportunity to invest in startups? It's very possible. And I would think with Silicon Valley, that's very likely, yes. All right, David, let me close up by this. Uh, 2008 was a nightmare. I sat in the Oval with uh, a half dozen other people and heard W explain to us what 2008 was like every Sunday afternoon, Paulson and uh, uh, who was the Fed chairman then, you know, the Bernanke, uh, Ben Bernanke, would sit there and explain to him why he had to do something he never thought he would have ever done as a conservative, and he did it. Are we even close to 2008 in your view? No, not even close. And the reason is what I just said about solvency versus liquidity, that these banks have more assets than liabilities by far. And that keep in mind, they, people needed to get out of the whole financial system in 08. It wasn't like you could go, oh, well, Lehman is bad. Let's go to Bear Stearns or let's go to Merrill Lynch. They were all going down. In this case, you've had hundreds of billions come out of regional banks to go to JP Morgan, to go to Wells Fargo or Citi. I don't think that's a good thing, Hugh, but what you have is regional banks getting weaker and big banks getting bigger. I thought Dodd-Frank was passed to avoid that. Well, I'll tell you, I don't think many banks are in trouble. My, my banking buddies are not worried. I'm not worried, and so it's not 2008, but I thought I would check with David Bonson. David, thank you for a good chunk of your time very early on the West Coast. Visit the Bonsongroup.com. You can go find it, Bonson Group, B-A-H-N-S-E-N, B-A-H-N-S-E-N. Thank you, David Bonson. I'll be right back, America. Go back to bed, David. I'm Hugh Hewitt.